My name is George Crispin. I've been a member of Woodbury Meeting since my father and mother took me here when I was two years old. That was a long time ago. And we are coming up on celebrating our 300th anniversary. Woodbury Friends Meeting has been here for 300 years. It was started to be built in 1714. And it was finished uh, that year and it has been here ever since. What we are going to do now is to conduct a tour of the meeting both inside and out and the grounds and the graveyard and we hope this is helpful and beneficial to everybody. The beginning of the settlement of this area by Quakers started in 1682. In May of 1682, Henry Wood was in jail in England. He had been converted to Quakerism and he had been persecuted for his worship of Quakerism. And many, many Quakers were in jail in 1682 in England. So the authorities made a deal and that was that they would allow Henry Wood to leave the country and leave jail if he would promise never to come back, and if he did, that he would be executed. And so Henry Wood gained the permission of the Quakers in that area and decided to set sail for America. They did set sail for America in the spring of 1682, and they arrived in the fall, the early fall 1682, down along the river and the river is down there. That is Woodbury Creek. They bought 300 acres of land and they settled there. And for a period of about 40 years, the Quakers settled the area. In the spring of 1683, John Wood, the son of Henry Wood, borrowed a canoe and paddled up what was then and is now the Woodbury Creek. And when he got to what he found to be an Indian trail, that he thought would be a very good place for a settlement. And that became the settlement that we now know as Woodbury. This road here, Broad Street, was an Indian trail and it traveled all the way from Salem, um, down in Salem, New Jersey, all the way up through Woodbury and on up to Burlington and, and, and further on. And this trail was north and south. And then the Woodbury Creek was east and west. And so it was a, a very good place to settle because you had mobility in those two directions. And so what happened was that as the area became settled and more Quakers came to the area, that they decided to move more and more inland. And the little cabin they had been using as a Quaker meeting house became too small. And so they decided that they would find a place that they could build a meeting house. And this became the ideal site because it is on a hill and it is close to the Indian Trail that now becomes Broad Street and Woodbury Creek, which at the time was called Red Bank Creek. Now, one of the things we have to do in our minds is we have to roll back the clock and imagine what this area was like in 1683 when John Wood paddled up the Woodbury Creek. First of all, it is all forest as far as the eye can see. It is forest. This place, which is now known as Woodbury, had one farm, to the best of our knowledge, that was a 200-acre farm that was settled by a Swede, and his name was Wallace Swenson. That farm, I think, later on became the Twells farm, and I can remember as a child seeing that farm out my school window. So there was a farm here within my lifetime, within the bounds of Woodbury, Woodbury history. Over there, beyond that, and toward the creek, was another farm that was the Tatum farm. That was a Quaker family who settled there. 
And so what happened was that the Quakers decided, and this was um, a Quaker group that included the grandson of Henry Wood, whose name was also Henry Wood, and they decided to buy a tract of land here, which they did. This parcel of land is today 2.6 acres, and it was thought to be an ideal spot for the building of a meeting house. And so, in the summer of 1713, they started to build a meeting house here, and the chief architect was John Cooper. John Cooper was a rather famous man. He was supporting of the American Revolution. He became a state senator in the first New Jersey State Senate, and he was a participant in the writing of the first New Jersey Constitution. We are standing in the burial ground of the Woodbury Friends meeting, and it tells us a lot about the history of the meeting. So as we look out over this burial ground, one of the things that we notice almost immediately is that the stones on this side are facing east and west. That is west, that is east. And the stones all face east and west. And the stones over there face north and south. In 1826, when they had the Orthodox Hicksite split in the meeting, they didn't divide the, they didn't have one, one group leave. They simply divided the grounds. And so this became the Hicksite side of the burial ground. And all the burials that took place uh, on this side were the Hicksite, and that became the Orthodox. And so in addition to that, we can determine by the names on the stones, we can determine who was Hicksite and who was Orthodox. Uh, the Whittalls over there, the Knights over here, they were the Orthodox, uh, these were the Hicksites. And so they, this is no longer true today because we no longer have that kind of separation. The other thing about where I'm standing that I would like to point out is that we have the tombstone here of a William Tatum and his wife, Anne. William Tatum owned the land that went from the meeting house property north and there was a stream there which we know is the Woodbury Creek and beyond that exactly how many acres I'm not quite sure but the meeting house grounds itself is 2.6 acres but there are several things about William Tatum that ought to be mentioned. The first thing is that this what we call Broad Street today, was a trail at that time that cut in front of the Woodbury Creek and then it became narrower uh, farther down east and they crossed. And his property was a farm that covered that ground. And William Tatum gave 20 acres of land on the west side of what today is Broad Street, but was then that trail. He gave 20 acres of land four African Americans to be buried. And that land stood there, well, it was there, all the way up to a relatively few years ago where the hospital bought the land and, and then they removed uh, the uh, remains of the people buried there. And there were some relatively important blacks buried there. And one African-American, and several African-Americans that were buried there were African-Americans who had helped the North and fought on the side of the North in the Civil War. The other thing that Joseph Tatum did was the children of African-Americans had school only in churches, African-American churches, and taught by African-American mothers up until Joseph Tatum and Joseph Tatum built the first school in the state of New Jersey that was a freestanding building for African-Americans to go to school. And that building still stands. It is down on Carpenter Street 
and it was built by Joseph Tatum, who lies buried here. And it was also part of the Underground Railroad. The bottom of it was a place where um, escaped uh, slaves would go to hide, but the school was actually used. Uh, when I was a child, the African-American students, e uh, even the ones living in North uh, uh, Woodbury, would walk to the Carpenter Street School and go past the elementary school, what was called Elementary Central. Only a few uh, African-American students went to the Elementary Central. Now, there are some other things that are very important about this graveyard. At a distance over in that direction, there is the burial spot of J. Harris Underwood. And J. Harris Underwood was the one who established in 1915 a hospital, the first hospital in Gloucester County. That hospital is today still there. And you can see it from where we're standing. But today it is huge. But at that time it was not huge. But it was a hospital. <coughs> and J. Harris Underwood was a member of this meeting. We're going to take a walk over to a, a monument that uh, honors the original Quakers who came here. But I want to show you this wall first. The wall indicates by the line, it indicates the two sides of the building. Now, there are several things about this that are very interesting. The original building stopped here. And when they decided to add it on, they brought in bricklayers and they put it here. But the bricklayers were not professional bricklayers or they never would have joined these two sides like this. They were farmers. Bricklayers would have these intertwined, these bricks intertwined. I brought a bricklayer expert over from England and he told me some very interesting things. One interesting thing was the bricklayers who built this side were farmers. They were not bricklayers. And the second is that whoever laid these bricks was left-handed. Now, don't tell me how he knew that, but he did. He was an expert in bricklaying, of course. Okay. This style of bricks, stretcher, 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 okay? Stretcher, stretcher, stretcher. Header, header, header. Stretcher, stretcher, stretcher. That style is known as English bond, and it's built for strength, not for looks. The front is Flemish bond, and that's built for looks, not for strength. And so the building, well, the peak of the building was, was uh, running east and west right from the very beginning. Now we're going to walk over to the wood monument. Okay. We are standing in the burial ground at Woodbury Friends Meeting, and the Woodbury Creek is right down there. And when the Wood family came over from Bury in England, they landed in what was then known as Upland, which we now know as Chester. And John Wood, Henry Wood's son, paddled across the Delaware and paddled up the creek and claimed uh, 300 acres of land. And there was a Quaker settlement down on what was called uh, Red Bank uh, Creek. And they established a settlement there. And one of the things that they, uh, Henry Wood uh, dedicated was that he dedicated a uh, half an acre of ground as a burial spot. And so in the beginning, they buried their dead down there along with probably some Indians. And in the course of time, National Steel Corporation wanted to buy that land, but there's a, a, a law in the state of New Jersey, you cannot build on any land where there are people buried. And so 
by an ordinance by the uh, court in the state of New Jersey, they decided to move those people who are buried down there, and they moved them here to Woodbury Meeting. So, we have two kinds of stones here. These are field stones, and they are the original stones from the burial ground, and they may very well be the uh, headstone of Henry Wood. The practice among Quakers was to be very simple and modest and only put your initials on. We can no longer read the initials, but there are original stones from that burial ground. In 1815, they changed the stones universally from field stone to the other kind of stone that were much more, much easier to work. Um, and so the stones that are taller, all these, okay, those stones are after 1815. And so they, they dug up the burial, uh, the people who were buried there, and they moved them here by court order. So Henry Wood, the founder of Woodbury, is buried um, here somewhere. I have several versions of how this went. One version is they came in, took all the bones and everything they got, came in here and dug a great big hole and put them all in there. They did not try to separate out everybody and so that's probably the way it went. But among the people that they dug up they found some who were buried sitting up and that's an Indian practice. So apparently there were some Indians. But Henry Wood, Alice Sale Wood, John Wood's wife, and the other original Quakers are buried here. Okay. These flowers were brought over here by airplane by Melvin Magnell who had to get them through customs to get them here, but they are from England and they are a gift to commemorate the stone. Now I will read the stone. This monument and the remains of 21 known and a number of unknown persons interred in the Woodbury ground near the mouth of the Woodbury Creek were removed to this site March 9, 1951, in accordance with the judgment of the Superior Court of New Jersey, entered February 1951. And that's when this all took place. Now the other side of the stone reads, The Wood Family Burial Ground, a portion of the land deeded in 1682 by Edward Billings of Westminster, Henry Woods Sr., and John Wood, his son, of uh, Bury, England, Lancaster, England, and claimed by the family on arriving here and becoming the first settlers of Woodbury. It was earlier used for burial by the Indians here was buried the above named Henry Woodson Sr., who died August 1918, I'm sorry, 1685, aged 64 years. John Wood devised this as a burial place for those who should come after him. Quote, remember the days of old on side the years of the many generations. For this intent, this stone is erected by the Gloucester County Historical Society of 1912. One last point, and that is we are looking down here at what was the Woodbury Creek, and in the spring of 1683, John Wood paddled up the Woodbury Creek and came to this Indian trail and that, which is now Broad Street, and that Indian Trail and the creek was the place of the founding of the city of Woodbury in uh, 1683. 
And then in 1714, they began building the meeting house, which was finished 300 years ago in 1715. Uh, in 1715, this was the doorway, and over this doorway, there was a roof that just covered the doorway and there was a mounting stone there and if you take up these bricks you'll find another side equal to that side and it is obviously the uh, uh, way that they entered into this building in the spring of 1715. We are now entering the building as they would have entered the building back in 1715 when the building was completed. And there are several aspects of the architecture that we know about because we have blueprints of the original building. So there are several points that needed to be made, one of which is that this is the front of the building and the front of the building faces what is today Broad Street, but at that time was a narrow trail, large enough for a wagon to go up and down. And then this was the door that people would enter to come in into the building. And the style of architecture was Georgian architecture. And that meant that if you had a window on one side, you had to balance it with a window on the other side. And if you had a doorway on one side, you had to balance it with a doorway on, on the other side. And so from standing here in this position, you had a doorway and you had, that was the main entrance doorway. Then you had a doorway on the side and a doorway over on the other side. And then people would come in and they would see benches lined up along here and benches lined up along here. And then up front here would be benches facing in this direction, and they were called facing benches. And they were for certain people to, to sit upon, usually people who spoke and leaders of the meeting were to be sitting on the facing benches. And this wall right here was not here. This wall went back a distance of four feet, and then there was a brick wall, and that was later on moved. The panels on the side are original. The panels on this side here and over there, balancing over, over there, they are original so far as we know, and they are in, in keeping with Quaker style of simplicity. Very simple panels. They have been painted over, but they are the, they are the original uh, panels. And to hold up the gallery up top, you have these posts. And then the beam across. And You'll note that the posts that are holding these, these up are one-third, one-third. They are one-third apart. On the other side that was added later, the posts are not one-third, one-third, and that, that makes a rather big difference, which I'll explain later. But people would come in and they would go up the stairs, and the stairs then ran out this way not the way they are today. The stairs today have been changed around in 1950 when they converted this, this uh, building into a school. And so they come down this way with a heater room and then lavatories and then a kitchen. But that's not the way it was then. So the stairs came down and the stairs came down on this side. So you would come in and you would go up the stairs whichever way you wanted. There was a practice for women and children to sit on one side and adult men on the other side. And so there were enough Quakers to fill up these benches here. 
and to fill up the galleries. And as time passed, the meeting grew in size, and the result was that it is in 1784 they decided to expand the building, and they doubled the size of the building, and they doubled the size of the galleries up top, and that made a big difference, and we'll see in the other room shortly how they changed that. But this room goes back to 1715, and in um, October of 1777, this room was used as a hospital where the wounded were taken from the Battle of Fort Mercer, and many of them came here to be treated for their wounds. And uh, this place played a rather large um, place in history by being a hospital after that battle. Okay, now we'll go into the other room and talk about that. The room into which we are walking was actually finished being built in the spring of 1765. And this room gives us information about the other room, which is the older room that was finished in 1715. It was started to be built in 1714 in the spring, and then um, was finished um, uh, in 1715. And then in 17. 84, they decided that the meeting house had grown in, in, in numbers and people who were attending, that they added on to that building. So the 300th anniversary of this meeting house is the 300th anniversary of that side of the meeting house, and this side of the meeting house is not as old. But uh, I need to point out certain things about the meeting house that gives us information about the original building. So, the original building actually came out to here, four feet beyond this, and there's a smudge on the wall over there that I put there by accident one time, and that tells us where this wall was. So that the original building came out to here and it faced Broad Street. So Broad Street was the front of the building. It had a style of, of, of architecture that was common in those days. It was called Georgian architecture, and it was built on the concept of balance. So in other words, if you have a, a window over here, you have another window over here. If you have a doorway here in the middle, it would be balanced, a doorway on the side, another doorway on the side. And so if we can imagine that instead of this being here, that this is a wall, and that that wall was made from the bricks of this wall that was, that was torn down. And this was the facing benches. And when they decided to add 26 feet to the existing meeting house, which may, means that the front of the meeting house uh, is going to become 52 feet. So what they basically did was they changed the meeting house around so that this is now the front of the meeting house. And built this, tore down this wall, moved this wall to that wall, and we can uh, believe that the original windows were in the same place on this wall, and then were moved there, and they are where they are today. And then they built this room. The chief architect was John Cooper. John Cooper was a very interesting person, controversial person in regard to Woodbury meeting because he supported the American Revolution. He was one of the original writers of the first constitution for the state of New Jersey and a member of the legislature of the state of New Jersey. And his son was a member of the Second Continental Congress. And he supported the American Revolution, generally speaking, and had lived up the street his house has since been torn down, and he was the architect. And so um, they built this room 
because the numbers of people who came in here and in order to do so, what they had to do was they had to change the um, building around. And so they built a gallery up there. And there was an already existing gallery on the other side. To support the gallery on the, in the other room, you have the posts one-third, one-third. But these posts here are not one-third, one-third because you have to have a post here to support the gallery, which has been built across here. And so this post is in a different position from the one on the other side. And so it holds both this gallery and that gallery, and then the other posts. And these are the original posts. So let me point out what was original to this side of the building. When this side of the building was built, um, it was started in the spring of 1784 and finished in 1785. And like I said, they moved the meeting house around. And out there were carriage houses. And there were carriage houses out there as well. And they built this as their facing benches. And the facing benches were built for people who were normally considered to be speakers. So if you're standing up here and you're speaking, you're up higher so people can hear you. So this was for people who were uh, thought of as being um, speakers. And the paneling here is much different on this side than it was on the other side. The other side is the original paneling that was finished in 1715. And this is the original paneling that was finished in 1785. But this paneling is more ornate. And being more ornate, there were some Quakers who were very strong in Quaker simplicity who didn't think that it was appropriate for it to be ornate. And so I'll go over the building piece by piece. First of all, on the ceiling up there, there's a ceiling, a series of hooks that go across. And they were hooked for lamps. That is what is called a town lamp. That's an original, except that's been wired for electricity. And these, were, these all hung. There were five of them across there. And they all hung the way this is hung. And they were lighted by uh, kerosene. Over here, we have a kerosene container. And this is what was used to fill those lamps that hung from the ceiling. And it's kind of far away, and I'll maybe walk over there uh, later. But over on uh, that door over there, to, that's under the uh, steps, is a container. And that was for matches. And underneath, it's rough. So they would strike the matches by rubbing them underneath, and then they would light the lamps. So that if it was dark or in the evening, that's how they lighted the meeting house. On the wall over there is a lamp. And that is the original spot where the lamp went. Because when I got that lamp and uh, decided to put it back up, I found out that the exact screw holes were still there. And so I put it back, although that's wired for electricity, but I put it back exactly where that lamp was when this part of the building was uh, finished. So the benches. The benches are an interesting story because in some ways they're all alike and in some ways they're all different. And the way they did it was, all the, the, almost everybody who was a member of this meeting at the time was a farmer. And they, they knew how to do carpentry, and they, they knew how to do things. And of course, they built the meeting house. And so each family was asked to build a bench. And so each of these benches are built in the same way. But each one, as you can tell, is individually different. I made uh, one of these benches myself that was um, outside, replacing the one outside that was being eaten by carpenter bees. 
and I found it to be a very interesting process. You have to have a piece of wood that's 14 inches, and you can only get that at the sawmill. You can't get it at a lumber yard. And so I have built one of these, but not nearly so well as the ones that you see here, that many of which are reinforced by iron. We are living in uh, South Jersey in an, an iron district, and the, and the iron industry in this was very strong, and so is the brick industry in this. So the bricks that went to build this building are also part of the bricks that went to build across the street at Charlie Brown's now, at a restaurant across the street. And so uh, this became um, the addition that was finished in 1785. So this is not, this part is not 300 years old, but the other part is 300 years old. Now, originally they had very meager paneling between these two sides. But what happened was in 1826, there was a split within the Society of Friends between the Hicksites and the Orthodox. And this was one of two meetings in the United States where they didn't separate. In other words, they continued to maintain the same property, but in Haddonfield and in Salem and in, other, in Woodstown and other places, they actually, the one side or the other left, it was usually the Orthodox that left, and they built their own meeting house. But that didn't happen here. So what happened here was, instead, they built this wall. This wall is a substantial wall and can be raised and lowered by pulling the ropes that are attached to pulleys. And that side of the meeting house was the Orthodox side, and this side of the meeting house was the Hicksite side. And they also separated the graveyard and the gravestones out there that face north and south, they are the Orthodox, and the ones that face east and west, they are the Hicksite. And they met in relatively peace and harmony for about 100 years. Somewhere around 1926, they decided to meet together. 1926. They decided to meet together, and they shared the meeting house when they needed. If there was a wedding or something, they would agree to let the other side use uh, the, the side that, 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 that was normally assigned to them. And then somewhere in the 1950s, they, they did away with the separation altogether. And today, there are no longer any Orthodox, there are no longer any Hicksites. And so this is the front of the meeting house today. And as I said, on this door, there is a small container. Underneath is rough. It took me quite a while to figure out what that was for, but uh, that's where the matches were, and you would strike the matches along the bottom, and that's how you would light the various lights that needed to be lit. In 1926, or thereabouts, they brought in electricity. And so from that point on, in my own personal life, we've always had electricity here. And um, when I was young, they had two stoves here. The two stoves that they had here, one was coal and one was wood, and they resided right here, and their pipes went across on this ceiling and then up through those openings there. And then from there, they were attached to the chimney, and then they went on up and outside. And so that's how the meeting house was heated. And in the wintertime, if you were cold, you moved closer to the stoves, and if you were too, too warm, you moved farther away. The door has the original lock. <clears throat> this is a huge lock, as you can see, but it was original. And it was a lock that was uh, used um, to lock the meeting house. And of course, it's long outdated. Uh, we have a modern lock today. And um, the door can be locked on this side by these rods that go up and down that keep this side in place. And then, like I said, we now rely on uh, modern locks to lock the meeting house. And this, far as I know, is the original 
wiring and the original locks, uh, 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 lights, uh, switches. So we'll now go upstairs. Okay. Well, that about does it for this room. Like I said, this was the Hicksite side. Um, and about um, 1920s, 1930s, they began to meet together. They would, older friends that I've known in the past used to tell me that they would be sitting here meeting for worship and somebody would speak on the other side and they would hear through the wall. <clears throat> and then after the meeting was over, they would meet outside and they would talk together. But they were basically very friendly. There were places where the Hicksite Orthodox split was not friendly. Now we're going to go upstairs. Okay. These are the original stairs. This handrail is not original. That was added later. But these are original. And the wood is yellow pine. Yellow pine does not exist in the extent that it did back when these buildings were built. Okay, we are standing on um, the, what, is, what was the gallery. It's no longer quite used for that, but this gallery went all the way around. And there are many things that each portion of the meeting house informs us about other portions of the meeting house. So to start with, let me say that, that these boards go all the way over to the wall, and that is 52 feet. The meeting house is about 52 feet square. And so any board that uh, needs to cover from wall to wall would be, have to be 52 feet long. This is yellow pine. That's number one. The boards are more than a foot, which means that no lumber yard today could produce these boards. This was not produced in a lumber yard, modern lumber yard. This was produced in a lumber yard or somewhere which was go back and they are about 14 inches and 52 feet long. There was a blight that hit the yellow pine at somewhere in uh, the course of history and it became scarce. But it, this gives you an idea of the size of the trees that were growing around here. And of course, none of these streets or houses uh, existed. It was all forest. But they had trees that were big enough to make a board that could go all the way across here. Now, in my lifetime, this area here was no longer used as a gallery, but it was used for quarterly meeting. There are seven Quaker meetings in South Jersey, and they meet four times a year, so they're called quarterly meeting. And they used to have quarterly meeting here when I was a child, and this is where they set up to eat their meal. How they ever did it is totally beyond me. But I do remember them doing it. And somehow they would put um, tables out here and chairs and people sat and they ate, ate. And it was quite an event. And over here you can see where the pipes came across from downstairs. And the pipes went up through those holes right there that are no longer being used because we don't have the stoves any longer. But they went up to the chimney up, up above. And so they would uh, be able to heat the meeting house. And the ladies brought up um, the food. The men carried up water. Everything had to be gotten from uh, local community pumps to, to, to bring that in here. And again, how they did it, because at the time there was no running water in the meeting house. There were no bathrooms in the meeting house. And so, but I remember as a child, them having quarterly meeting and they, their meal was here. This is now used as a library. It has a lot of books, a lot of books. A lot of members over the years have donated their books. We had one member who was a Methodist minister, and he had a lot of religious books. I was a teacher. I don don't, donated uh, some of my books that were used in my teaching. And so there's a lot of books in here. 
And so now we're going to go upstairs into the third floor, which is in some ways, this is a cabinet full of books. And some of these books are very, very old. There is at least one book in here. I don't have it necessarily at hand, but there is one book in here that was uh, published the same year that Abraham Lincoln was born. Uh, I'm holding in my hand a book um, that was published in 1865. This book was published in 1865, and it's in very good shape, actually. So we have some pretty valuable books there. Okay, we need now to go up to the third floor. So uh, we'll do that. When they built the third floor, they wanted to have access to it, and so they built this stairway here, and this leads up to the third floor. Okay, we're now standing on the third floor of the meeting house, and we're standing on the side that's the newer side, and that was finished in 1785, and they decided they wanted to have a room up here. Now, the other side does not have a room. And that created several problems. So to begin with, let me say that the walls are made out of plaster that is made from horsehair. I don't know a lot about how they did it, but apparently they, they, they got the horsehair from the mane of the horses, and then they uh, clipped it up and put it in the mixture, and then that became... Uh, in some way, uh, better plaster, and all these go back to that. And that means that this is a rarity. In other words, you don't find many buildings that have uh, plastered walls that are made of horsehair. That's number one. Number two, you have a chimney here. Now, this chimney, as I said, our, the architecture is based upon the Georgian style of architecture, so if you have a window over there, you have to have a window over here. But if you have a chimney that goes through the center of the, of, of the roof, the peak of the roof over on that side, you've got to have a chimney that goes through the center of the roof on this side. But the problem is you had the stairway coming up. So since you had the stairway coming up, you've got to move the chimney over. And so what they did was something spectacular in my opinion and I've been up on top here to see that this is the case as the people laying the bricks went up they calculated exactly how far over they had to have this chimney move as it went up and each brick was laid exactly in place to move the chimney over and when we go in the other room we'll see this I think but this chimney actually moves over, moves over, moves over, and comes out through the peak of the roof to satisfy the requirements of Georgian agriculture, uh, architecture, which meant that the, that the other chimney, which came out through the peak, it will match that. Okay. The other thing that's interesting about this is that this is the original stove, and I have seen this stove lighted up and cooking meals. I remember it as a child, but I have no understanding as to how they could possibly do it. Now, this stove at one time had legs on it, but I took the legs off because it, it was somewhat dangerous. If it ever fell over on somebody, it would do great damage. But that was the original stove, so they brought the wood up, they started the stove, they had the stove going, the pipe of the stove went out through the chimney, and they cooked their meals on this stove, bringing up water, bringing up the wood, everything. And it was cooked here, and I personally would never do this because I would be afraid of setting the meeting house on fire, but there, I, I've never heard of an incident in which the meeting house was ever a problem in that regard. And of course, they had many, many people helping, but the men carried the heavy things, the women carried the food, and so this room was used to cook the meals that they ate on the room below this downstairs. 
I remember that as a child that we had parties up here when I was a little, when I was little, and I can remember one Halloween party we had up here when I was a child. I was dressed as a rabbit. With my mother drew uh, uh, rabbit uh, whiskers on me. So we'll now move into the other room. One feature of this room that uh, took me a while to explain, but I want to explain it now. And that is this door. Why would they put a doorway here where there is absolutely nothing that it could possibly lead to and there's nothing on this side from which it leads? So why is the door here at all? It took me a while to figure it out. Now, here's the answer. Over on that side, directly over, there is a window and that window correspond with this window on this side. In the summertime, this place gets very, very hot, as you can imagine. So you open the window over there, you open the window over there, and you, then you open the door, and you get a cross breeze that takes the hot air out. And that's the answer as to why they put a door here. No one ever goes through this door. The other aspect of this door is, now, this may seem like a little matter, but it's not. There is a thumb latch here that has basically never been used. When you find thumb latches in old buildings that have a door that requires a thumb latch, so many people have, have put their thumb on that that it bends it. It's bent down. And if you go into an antique store, you will look forever to find one that's not bent. This thumb latch is not bent. It's as original as it was on the day they put it in here. The other thing I want to share with you is that we have one piece of the original shingle. The original shingles on the roof um, were pine shingles um, and they did fairly well for probably 50 to 100 years, but in the course of time, all shingles wear out. This is the only original piece left, and you can see the holes where the nails went. The nails, by the way, were, were, were made by getting a very long piece of steel, and it's square, and then cutting off where you want the length of that nail to be, and so the nails were square. They, in the course of time, took the, oh, by the way, here is a square nail. That is a square nail. You could see that. And that is one of the original nails. And of course, the whole nail is square. And the top is square, OK? And they uh, took the shingles off. They were cedar shingles. And then they put the slate roof on. Now, the slate is very good, very strong, lasts a long time. The problem with slate, however, not everybody knows how to do it, and it's no longer done. This probably lasted for about 100 years, and then it began to leak. And here's the hole. Putting a hole in slate is tricky business. You don't want to split the, the slate. And like I said, there are people who know how to do this, and so if you're going to replace a slate window, a, sl a slate um, a roof with a slate roof, you've got to spend some money and get people who know what they're doing. So somewhere in the 1960s, the roof began to leak. We didn't know what to do about it. And so we decided we took all the slate off and then we put a modern roof on it. And that modern, tar paper roof has been replaced about two times, but it doesn't leak, so that's a good thing. Okay, now we're gonna go into here. In some ways, this is the most interesting room because the original construction, the original architecture is revealed by going into this room. 
So let me go in here. Okay. <clears throat> Now the first thing that you might want to notice is that there are pulleys there, and they are the pulleys that when you pull the ropes down on the first floor, it will raise the panels. They will, they will come up, and that's what those pulleys are for. And they've been doing that now uh, since about the 1920s um, when they put the, the panels in. Okay. <coughs> <clears throat> okay. In order to build this building, they had to build the walls first. And the arrangement of bricks on the two sides of the building are what is known as English bond, and they are built for strength. And the the arrangement of bricks on the front of the meeting house is Flemish bond, and it's arranged for looks. And so it is quite apparent, undisputable, that the front of the meeting house originally, when it was first built, faced Broad Street, and the two walls on the side were built for strength to hold on this roof. Okay. Now, the question is, how do you get a piece of wood that is 25 inches deep, that is about 15 inches wide, and 52 feet long? That tells you something about the kind of trees that were growing around here when this meeting house was built in 1715. You can see from the size of these pieces of wood the kind of lumber we're talking about, and you can see the kind of weight we're talking about. I have no idea how much this would weigh, but it had to be tremendous, and this was all done without modern machinery. Now, I've had timber frame constructionist experts up here. One came and spent two hours, crawled all over the place. He was delighted and took pictures and wrote notes and so forth. So the best guess is they put this together on the ground piece by piece, and then they put it on top of the, of the walls of the meeting house and then by the use of block and tackle and probably oxen, they pulled it up. So it was standing like this. I mean, the, 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 the engineering requirements, you probably had to have 50 farmers here to help. Uh, I'm only guessing, but you can see the size of this. And so they would put this down and then they would put this on top. And this is known as King's Truss. The formulation of the, of the truss on top of this is known as the queen's truss, and it's somewhat smaller. Okay. All right. Once they got this up, they put this iron. Now, this, it, this area was, was known for its ironworks, and they got this iron, and they reinforced the wood by putting in the iron. These are stapled into here, pounded in, and this, of course, is uh, put through to hold it in place. This was a process that was invented in England, and it was illegal to take that process out of England. And somebody came over from England. We don't know who, possibly one of the Quakers, but somebody came over and knew the process and applied that process to the building of this meeting house. And of course, John Cooper was the architect, so he might have had something to do with it. Now, when they cut this piece of wood that had to go into this, they marked it by putting in three, three marks. And over here, you have four marks. And it starts over there, and it moves in this direction. And so this is four, three, 
two, one, and so forth over in that direction. And so you see the, the marks all throughout of the original axemen who wanted to make this to fit. They wanted to make it to, to, be, to be what it needed to be to fit into this design. And it is absolutely staggering uh, the, the, the height of it and the weight of it and how they ever put it all together uh, with only uh, animal and human strength to do it. No machinery. Now, as I said, on top originally were cedar shakes that were uh, shingles. And then after that came the slate. And then after that came what is there now. That's plywood. Um, and these are the original pieces of wood to hold up the roof that run across and run through these uh, pieces of wood and attach to them. And so that's all original. Now they look like they've been, they've been burned, but they're not. That's, that's, that's age. That is not a fire in here. There was never a fire in here that we know anything about. Uh, and, and wood, certain wood ages, and it ages like that. And so this, where I'm standing, this roof has stood here for 300 years. Now the wood, the, the roof that's up there now is a modern roof. It's, uh, it's plywood upon which uh, there was placed um, modern uh, tar paper shingles, uh, and it's been done at least twice in, in, in my memory. The floor, um, underneath this floor, there is insulation. And we felt when the British were going to come over, uh, there were going to be 300 British walking through here, and we decided that it would be a good idea not to have someone step on that, and so I put the floor in. So all across here is floor, and these are some of the original meeting house benches. When we changed the, the meetings, the, the, social, the social room side, we changed that into a school in 1950. There were benches that were left over, and so these are some of the ones that were left over from that. But I put the the floor in. The windows are the original windows, so far as we know. I am now standing where only a few times I ever stand, but this is standing on the beams that ab actually represent the, the skeleton of the, of the lumber of the meeting house. This will show you the beams, and you can see them. You can see there are axe marks in the wood, and you can see that they made holes that other wood were to go in to make it stronger. This section over here is the section that was built in 1784, and up on top, which we will look at in a moment, it is known, known as the Queen's Truss. When you look down here, you see just about as raw an example of the timbers that built the meeting house. What you see on the floor is actually insulation that has nothing to do with the original meeting house at all. But I have been down all the way to the end of this section, all the way to the brick, which represents the outside wall, and carved into the wood there some workmen having lunch, perhaps, back in 1785, um, carved the date, 1785. And that's the date at which this side of the meeting house was finished. So in the spring of 1785, some workmen carved that in there. And it is interesting to have that connection with a person that was working on this meeting house 300 years ago. I have no idea who it was, but that's the connection that I have. And you can see all of the raw, the very raw um, timber and the way it was put together. You see iron right there. Those portions were connected by iron. And um, that was a method of, um, 
of, of, of doing the, the building back at that time. And New Jersey had plenty of iron. I am now going to alight the portion on top. And you can see the structure up on top there. And what you need to look for is the chimney. There it is. Now, when they built this room, they wanted to have a staircase coming up. And so they had to build the chimney in such a way, if it was going to be consistent with Georgian architecture, the chimney had to be coming out the peak of the roof. And so every layer, they had to calculate exactly how much to move that chimney over so that it would come out at the top of the roof. This shows you the skill of these farmers that built this building. They were not bricklayers. We know that. I had a bricklayer come over from England who went over all the bricks of the building, and the building was not built by bricklayers. It was made of brick, but not built by bricklayers. But that chimney moves over, and that stove was used on this third floor when I was a child, and remember them cooking up here when they had quarterly meeting, and they would carry all the food, all the water, all the wood, everything up here. The stove connected to the chimney, and that's where the exhaust went. It's an amazing, when you think about it, it's an amazing piece of architecture. And the building, of course, is an amazing building. And it's still going strong. This room in which we are now standing on the third floor of the original meeting house that was built 300 years ago gives us a sense of appreciation how they could build a meeting house that would last 300 years and this shows the original architecture and how difficult it must have been for them <coughs> to do have <coughs> done all this without modern machinery. So in some ways, this is the most interesting room. And so 300 years this spring in 2015, we have a meeting house that is still being used every Sunday and will continue to be used, I hope and feel true, for another hundred years, or maybe another 300 years. Hope you've enjoyed the tour.